a wonderful promise that our salvation is not earned by any good works which we can do. It's the gift of God. Titus 3, 5 through 7. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed abundantly on us through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his words, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even through even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified through faith of Christ. And not by works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Good evening. This is still not on. Now you can have it. Good evening. It's still not on. There we go. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's good to see you. We are glad for the Patch the Pirate Choir. That was wonderful. Well, it's our turn. Let's sing together our theme chorus. It happens to be number 380 in your hymnal, Faithful Men. We're just going to sing the first verse and the chorus. So let's stand as we sing this together.
Number 337 in your hymnal, the angels are singing again. I once was a seeker far from the lies of the sun. A lost in the night till Jesus cried out, the clear of and singing again. He gave me his garment and took all my sin. Jesus forgave and cleansed me within. Christ is my Savior. Please be seated. Let's begin with prayer. Lord, we thank you for these young folks and oh, what good things they're learning, what potential they possess, and we just ask you to help us and our part to do all we can to help them grow in you. Lord, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for your comfort and strength for Ryan Porter and the passing away of his mother this past week. Thank you for helping with the Graveside service, the memorial service for Kermit Olson. We do pray for his wife and family. Thank you that family was able to be with us this morning. Just be with them as a part of them fly back to Korea. And we thank you for, Lord, what's ahead for us tonight. We thank you for the canavans being with us. And we thank you for the way you've used them already. Be with them again tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sing a song, one of the, one uh, of many that Ron Hamilton has written, "Wings as Eagles." Three hundred three, right there in your hymnal, if you need that.
sing one more from our dear brother Ron Hamilton be still and know 436 in your hymnal Let's bow for prayer as we receive this evening's offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are here tonight. It's a blessing to be gathered as believers. And Lord, I pray that you would help the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart tonight to be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for the good music this evening. At the Welcome Center, there are sign-up sheets for basketball and volleyball, um, aid, uh, grades uh, 6 through grade 12. So that'll be beginning in uh, oh mid part of October. Have more specific dates, but uh, note that if you would. And then 
Keep in mind that on Wednesday evening, we begin the Money by the Book, or we, we continue the study Money by the Book, and those are, we ran out last week, so we're, they're scheduled to uh, arrive on Monday, and we'll have the bookstore open ahead of the service on Wednesday, so you can pick those up. For the teens, please see Mr. or Mrs. Olson about your books. That'll be an advantage to you to do it that way. Then uh, keep in mind on this Friday night, um, men's rally in Salem, and there's uh, still a sign-up sheet at the Welcome Center. I think probably tonight is probably, um, uh, should be the last time you sign up for that so that we can get a final number down to them and they can plan. Then College and Career has an event coming up. Uh, note that on Sunday afternoon, October 9. Other details coming to you by email. And then our Fall Children's Harvest Carnival coming up on Saturday the 22nd. There's uh, materials there at the, the Harvest booth and tickets. And if you have questions, someone um, can help you with uh, answers to that. Take the flyers, a couple of those with you, each one if you would, and, and make a point to hand those out throughout the week. Well, it's a joy to have uh, Brother Canavan uh, speak to us again tonight. I believe he's got a, some video to show us as well, but we're going to sing one more song and then he will come. Let's stand as we sing this together. It is no secret. Please be seated. All right, it is again good to be with you this evening, and thank you, Pastor Jake With, for allowing me uh, to be with you this evening. Uh, missions is always a cooperation. It is always a team effort. It is you and I working together to go into the world to see people saved and congregated into churches. Now, the first 11 years of our ministry was pretty slow. Uh, there were some people being saved. There were some things that were happening. But the last 11 years, we've been there 22 years, have been much more fruitful outwardly, and we've seen a lot more happening. And so we're really excited about the church that we together, as a supporting church and as a missionary that you've sent out, what we've seen the Lord do. And I think the, the, the video will do a good job at giving you kind of a broad overview of that work. Ireland is a country of great beauty, from the green rolling hills to the rough and rugged Atlantic coast. Its history stretches back 5,000 years, and its landscape is dotted with ancient burial sites, castles, and monasteries. On December 6, 1922, Ireland became free from Great Britain. The Irish then gave the Roman Catholic Church enormous power the abuses the Roman Catholic Church then perpetrated is truly astonishing. Up through the 1990s, Ireland remained mired in spiritual darkness and poverty. During the 1990s and into the early 2000s, Ireland became the Celtic Tiger, transitioning from one of the poorest countries in Europe to one of the wealthiest. During our time in Ireland, 
We've seen them turn from dead religion to worldly prosperity and continue to flounder in spiritual darkness. They have found no light in regressive socialism or the teachings of academia and media. Wealthy, highly educated, and mature Southeast Dublin is the epicenter of this darkness. The cost of living in Southeast Dublin is the top 1% of the world, contributing to church plant failures in the past. Yet we know it is God's will for there to be a gospel witness in this dark and forbidding landscape. We know that God wants a doctrinally pure church here, and I am thankful that God has called me and my wife to this needy place. In 2018, God miraculously enabled us to buy the building we had been renting. Though the building was purchased from sacrificial giving in Ireland and help from the USA, nearly 70% of that building's cost will be from Irish giving. This is the first time a fundamental Baptist church has obtained a building inside the Beltway or Southeast Dublin. Though the high mortgage makes finances tight, Irish giving will hopefully pay off the mortgage in 2027, enabling the church to pay its own pastor and become truly self-supporting. We have several ways of working with children. Every Sunday morning, we have children's church. Each Wednesday evening during the school year, we have Truth Trekkers, a children's Bible club. We have church kids and non-church kids that attend this club. The first week of July, we have Summer Bible Camp. Children come and hear the gospel for the first time. After a clear gospel presentation, several of the children will accept Christ as their Savior. This summer, four children accepted Christ as their Savior in Summer Bible Camp. In August, we host an art camp with a totally different group of kids from Summer Bible Camp. We do two art projects each day along with a Bible lesson. We see children saved in this each year as well. This year we saw five saved. Both camps generate new contacts for us to work with through the following year. We have had families join our church as a result of their child coming to one of these camps. The church has come to have significant gospel influence in many lives through the weekly church services and Bible studies. There is a solid core of grounded, evangelizing, fundamental Baptist believers. Each week we have between five and seven trained soul winners out knocking on doors. As we attempt to lead them to Christ, we'll share as much gospel truth as they will allow. We're also in the process of passing out and calling back on 10,000 Bibles that Andrew and Sean brought over in their container. The church has an increasingly deep reach into the community around us. Some come to us for weddings and funerals. This gives us a unique opportunity to spread the gospel even more widely to those who would not normally come. Ireland has had double digit growth for years. It's a tech and pharmaceutical hub. People from all over the world come to Ireland because of the high paying jobs. And God has given us a remarkable opportunity to work with these economic migrants. God is saving some and grounding numerous young, smart, highly educated believers with solid, fundamental Baptist teaching. Over the years, we've given particular attention to discipling men. We enroll men in a comprehensive course of biblical teaching and doctrine. This is really a mentoring time where we make specific applications of truth to form a Christ-like character in the men. It takes 18 months to two years to complete the program. We now have men that are sound in the faith, consistently soul winning, and have sincere prayer lives. We're in the next phase of actively training men for leadership and long-term ministry. We hope to keep these men in Ireland so they're faithfully pastoring Baptist churches in Ireland and Europe. Hi, my name is Joan Fleetwood. Um, my husband and I found Hope Baptist Church 10 years ago, and I must say I feel at home. Every time I come here, I feel the messaging is so clear and so precise, and learning about life is all in the Bible, and that's the way Pastor Dan 
treats it. Uh, the fellowship is wonderful with all the other people as well. And I found that when my husband passed away a year and eight months ago, I got great comfort from coming here. Hello, my name is Mustafa. My name is Nicholas. I was saved from um, Catholicism, uh, followed by a very long period of <laughs> wandering, uh, aimless atheism and nihilism. Um, I found peace in the Lord in 2018 through a gospel tract. I, in, in Hope Baptist Church, I found um, everything, everything I could look for, everything I could want in a church. Diligent adherence to God's true word, which is found in the King James Version the purity of the preaching, the purity of the fellowship, and um, the purity of the discipleship. Um, I have benefited greatly from the discipleship lessons offered by Pastor Dan. He has given me a thorough and concise grounding in the Bible. I entered the church in a state of absolute ignorance. I am now far more, far more informed as, as to the living word of God, what it is, what it is about, what it has for what it has for us, and thanks to thanks to the wonderful opportunities given by this church to help me grow and develop as a as a sanctified Christian. Hi, I'm Mario. I'm Christina. And I'm Christine. I'm Mariah. I'm Haley. We moved to Ireland to have a better living, and we raised in Roman Catholic belief. And when we heard about the gospel in Hope Baptist Church, our life changed. Our family are all saved and baptized in this church. My family are so blessed. Our pastor Dan and his wife are very supportive. They preach the truth about Jesus according to the Bible scriptures. Uh, I like all the events that happen in this church. For example, the Holiday Bible Club. I love all the people in the church as they are supportive and they help us in our deepest needs. I like how the members of the church have become our extended family in Ireland. I like uh, the Baptist Church, especially uh, Pastor Dan. While we work to train up God-called men for ministry here in Europe, we also have the opportunity to help new missionaries get established in Ireland. Andrew, our son, and his wife, Sean, and their daughter, Claire, are completing an 18-month transition into Irish culture and Irish church life. They've been involved in preaching, teaching, serving, finances, and audiovisual efforts. Ireland is a closed mission field, and unless a church with its own building sponsors a new missionary, they can't get in. Though it involves considerable work with lawyers and accountants and carries a degree of risk, we are thankful for the opportunity to help new missionaries become established in Ireland. There's never been a more exciting time in the church plan. A good group of men are going soul winning every week. Believers are being saved and baptized. Young believers are being grounded in solid doctrine and the next generation of leaders are being raised. All right, it's been quite a while since we've been here and I'm glad we had the opportunity to show a video and uh, show you a little bit more about <coughs> what's happening there. When we moved to Ireland, Ireland was a relative backwater um, economically. They were, they were, they had been very stagnant for many years. They had been in the grips of Roman Catholicism. Unlike um, many places in the world, they were truly um, in, in ingrained in, in a fundamental um, European Roman Catholicism. As tech companies, Intel uh, and others began to move over there, Ireland welcomed them, created a, a very law-abiding society, good tax structure, and did a lot of things to make it very suitable for them. 
And gradually, Ireland became a Silicon Valley environment. When Beth and I moved there in 1999, we had no idea where that was going. We just knew there was a little bit of a change. Ireland is a very different place now than it was when we came in 1999. Ireland is, a, it is, it is at the top 1% of the world and attracting people from all over the world to work in really very high paying jobs. And one of the things that we are doing is we are reaching into these economic migrants that are coming into the country. And a lot of them are very smart, they are very talented, but almost none of them are fundamental Baptist and some of them are unsaved. And what God has given us the opportunity to do through the building that he has provided and the situation that we have is to retrain these people in solid, fundamental, independent Baptist doctrine and teaching and bring them into a much more sustainable belief structure. And by that I mean I believe that it is a belief structure that is true to the Bible and is an authentic representation of Bible teaching. And uh, Beth and I are just super excited about that. My wife Beth is integral to everything that we're doing there. She works with the ladies, she works with the children, uh, she organizes many other aspects of the ministry, and uh, just very, very grateful for her help there. So I guess to summarize the church, it's that it has a much deeper reach. There was a time in the church to where we were, it was just Beth and I, and we were knocking on thousands, and we still knock on thousands and thousands of doors every year. But it is much more than that now. We, uh, during our summer camps, we were drawing Irish families from the area around us, and we, we drew several of them. And that was really unique, um, that they were, they were coming to us. They're recognizing that we're different, and that there is a, there's, they're coming to trust us in a way that they never have before. And so we're just super excited what the, about what the Lord is doing. The attendances are up, and we are seeing people saved. We had five baptisms in August. And we saw nine children saved in um, July and August in the two camps that we had. We've seen others saved on the door throughout the year. And uh, just the Lord's been very, very good. So, um, Pastor, I'd like to thank you for your leadership in the church. And church, I would like to thank you for helping to make this happen. Because this is what missions is. This is what missions does. It builds gospel-centered preaching churches in the world around us in these places of great darkness, these places of great need, there's a vibrant witness. And that is a result of you and your sacrificial giving and prayers. And because of that, that church is there. I'd like to talk a little bit this morning, as we, this evening, excuse me, as we get into the message, about how you and I can find significance. I'll be preaching out of Matthew chapter 16 and uh, verse number 13 and 18. But if, if we could begin with a word of prayer, uh, perhaps the Lord would, would meet with us. Father, we pray now that as we look at the preaching of your word, as we begin to look at how you have worked in times past and how you are working today, Father, I pray that you would help us. Lord, in this message, I pray that you would be present that you would be working in each of our hearts and each of our lives. Father, I pray that you would teach us what you want to teach us, that you would show us the truth that we need in our day. So, Father, please use the preaching of your word in each one of our lives. Father, we beseech you, we seek you, God, that you would help us in this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. Someday we're going to die, and our life will be summarized very briefly, perhaps in a sentence. Maybe those who are much closer to us will have a longer summarization, but, but many times our lives will be summarized very succinctly. And the longer that we were dead, the, lo the more succinct I believe that summarization will become. All of us desire significance. It's a foundational need within us. And if we look at why we say the things that we say or do the things that we do, it, you can see the desire to know that we had a life of meaning, a life of real value and purpose is interrelated with that action or that word that was spoken, us, spoken, spoken by us. So a lot of what drives us and our expectations 
is bound in how we view the effect of our life. A sociologist, Tony Campolo, asked 50 people over the age of 95 what they would do differently if they could live that life again. And he summarized it into two brief statements. He, they said, first of all, if I had to do it all over again, I would go through life reflecting more, meaning that they would consider and think about their life and why they were doing what they were doing. And secondly, he, they said if they had to do it over again, they would do, do more things that would live on after they have died. Now, why would they say that? Why would they make that statement of things living on after they have died? Because the things that we do in this life have so little significance. So often, our actions and words in the course of our life are not making an eternal difference. And we are created in the image and distinct likeness of God. We are eternal beings. We have an innate and comprehensive sense of eternity. We know what is, be we know there was something before. We know there is something ahead. We are living in that realm of eternity. We are eternal beings. And when we begin to look at life as a temporal being, and we begin to try and draw out of life only that which is temporal, only that which can be seen or felt, pleasure and possessions and power, and we begin to say, this is where life's value is found as an eternal being, we feel empty. We feel futile. We feel there's no real effect in the life that we have lived. If there is one word that describes the world outside of Christ, it is the word futile. The world is a futile place. It is an empty place. When you look at what they're living for, when you look at what their values are, so what? To what end or what value is it? It has no eternal value. It has no eternal worth in it. And when we begin to live according to those values, and when we begin to adopt those thoughts, and we begin to think and live that way, we experience the same emptiness and the same futility as the world which is around us. We are eternal. We are created in the image of God with the distinct likeness of God. You know, that is why you can go anywhere in the world and people are worshiping. Have you ever thought about that? If there were no God, no one would be worshiping. They wouldn't. Why would you worship if there was no God? There's no purpose. There's no reason. There's no meaning. You'd be diving into carnal pleasure. Men have their, their arms lifted in the jungles of South America, in the deserts of Saudi Arabia. They worship, they know not what, but they're worshiping their creator. All around, their arms are lifted. They're searching the heavens, they're searching the sky for their creator, and they're confused by false teaching. But they know there is a creator. They're an eternal being. They're searching for significance and value in their life. We look in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 7. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 7. The Bible says that just Lot, God delivered just Lot who is vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. He hungered for the world, the fleshly pleasures, the being thought well of by the people of the world. He cared about how they thought, and he began to become vexed. He began to be characterized by futility. It was his life, and it was a life that was so empty. It was a life that was so unfulfilled, and it is not the life that God wants us to live. So how can we 
really find significance? What, what, what way can we do that? How do we come to that place? Well, I think it helps if we take a comprehensive view of the Bible. If we just step back for a minute and we begin to think and we begin to look at what God's doing. Because God is, is extremely strategic. He's very, very intentional in the works that he's doing. When he begins to create the world, he is very, very specific and intentional in the way that he does this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when he brings the dry land forward, the herbs and the fruit-bearing plants, and then he brings the animals forward, he then brings man with a distinct and clear likeness of himself. He is innately social. He's an eternal being in a mortal body. He has the capacity to know, love, and worship God. He is intelligent. He has memory. He has recall. He has the, the, the ability to analyze, the ability to think. He has moral, a moral basis. No one else in the created world has that moral basis. No creature. And yet he does. He, he knows right from wrong. And he has a sense of, of grief when wrong is done. So by the third chapter of Genesis, we see that man has, has gone his own way. But interestingly, God is not wringing his hands and wondering, what will I do now that man has chosen his own path? In Genesis chapter 3, in verse number 15, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. So notice God is immediately resolving. He is immediately at work providing an atonement, providing a covering for the sins of man. And about four-fifths of our Bible is the outworking of God's plan to buy us back. So how does God then reveal himself to man? Well, when we're dealing with apologetics in Ireland, and we deal a lot with that, with people who have no Bible foundation, who are secular, atheists, and it's important to know the Bible gives truth in a very controlled set of circumstances. So when God reveals himself, he reveals himself in a unique situation. Abraham has Isaac, and Isaac and Rebekah have Jacob. And Jacob's 12 children, those 12 tribes, become a nation. And then God works within the bounds of that nation. And so through his interaction with the nation, we're gaining a picture of him, of what he likes and doesn't like, of his character, of his mercy, of his love, of his holiness, of his power, of his knowledge. And we begin to get a very clear picture of him. The Bible is amazing in its consistency. Did you know, a lot of times when um, we're talking with an unsaved person, the fact that the Bible is so uniform, we can preach out of any part of the Bible, and it says the exact same thing. It never contradicts itself. It's, it's amazing. It's completely uniform. Wherever you go in the Bible, it's not contradicting. It's, it's, it's just absolutely an amazing book. So through his record with Israel, and as Moses comes, he codifies the law. The, the understanding of God becomes very clear. His law is, is making that line in the sand. It's making it very, very clear what's right and what's wrong. And we're seeing more and more of our guilt and our sin and the perfect righteousness of God through that, those 613 laws that he has given us. So in type and example, the picture of Christ arises very clearly. Jesus is seen by the work of the judges, the kings, the priests, the prophets. It all begins to point to him and reveal him as the Messiah. Look with me in Numbers chapter 21 and verse number 8, and then we'll go to John chapter 3, Numbers 21. So as the children of Israel, let me give you an example here, as they're wandering in the desert, they come to a place of of, of having re rejected God, of not appreciating his goodness and his work, of not wanting his intervention, his provision, his protection in their life. And they begin to moan. Now, that's an Irish word for complain. They begin to whinge, or, or not, the American way would be whine, 
about their situation. And essentially, there, there's a sense of the rejection of God, and ultimately, God judges them for sin in their life. And the judgment is in the form of a fiery serpent. So the bite of the serpent is the judgment. The, the judgment is that sin, that, that venom that is coursing in their veins that is bringing them to a certain and quick death. Verse number, uh, number 21, verse number 8, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. They stand in the desert. Death is encompassing them. It is creeping towards them. That venom is hastening their death. They're quickly descending they're falling apart because of their sin. And God says, I want you to send the emblem of that sin. I want you to send the picture of your sin, the death, the dead serpent. And I want you to hang it on a pole. How can you hang a serpent on a pole? Well, it has to have something that will hold it. And the serpent is draped on that crossbeam that is holding it. And here is death of that which has brought misery. Here is the death and the end of that which has brought death into the world. It is before them. And if they will look to what has victory over them, if they will look to what God has provided in the cross, they will live. In John chapter 3 and verse number 14, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. And he's using this illustration which would be in, in, he would be intimately familiar with. He says in John chapter 3 and verse number 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent which is in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So we begin to see the picture of Christ, that he will defeat sin. The power of sin will be broken. There is healing, there is restoration, there is renewal, there is new life in him. If we will look, we will live, but only if we will look. Well, gradually as the Old Testament moves forward, we see Christ unveiled in Isaiah. In Psalms 22, he is there. He is before us. And then... The Bible tells us in Galatians 4, in verse number 4, he's coming. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. When the Messiah was born, he's not born in a palace. He's not welcomed by kings. Humble shepherds on the countryside usher in his arrival. He cares nothing for the pomp, for the prestige of the world. He is a Messiah. He is bringing a spiritual healing and he is bringing a spiritual kingdom into our world. And it says when the fullness of time was come, when the Greeks had come and established, they had Hellenized the world, they, they brought their language, they brought their culture, the Romans brought their administration, their, their legal structure, their roads, and, and God in the midst of his sovereign power and knowledge, when the fullness of time was come, he brought forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem us who were under a law, of the law. This is the fleshing out. This is the culmination of God's work among us. The Savior, the Messiah has come. And when he comes, he presents himself as a legitimate offer of the kingdom to the Jews. He's presenting the spiritual kingdom, but they are embedded in power structures they're using religion to enrich and empower themselves. And they do not want the spiritual kingdom. They want a temporal kingdom. They want what a temporal kingdom offers them. And when Jesus threatens, they, they perceive as a threat to their temporal security and prosperity, they want to kill him. And as we come to about John chapter 10, we begin to see that they have rejected their Messiah. They, they don't want him. And we see that Jesus then begins to move 
once that rejection of him has been complete or absolute, he begins to move. And he goes up to a region of Caesarea Philippi. And I remember your pastor taking me there. And I remember being awestruck at Caesarea Philippi. Here is the mouth of hell. This is the very epicenter of paganism in the world. But just beyond that, hundreds of meters away, is Dan. And that is the epicenter of paganism and heathenism in Israel. And Jesus walks into this place and he says that he is the rock of the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 32, he is the rock. He is the immovable structure. He is God himself. And he as the rock will build his church and the gates of hell, which are all around, will not prevail against him. It's an amazing thing that he is doing here. From this point forward, the thing that he is doing is, is essentially connected to these local assemblies of baptized believers who've joined for the purpose of fulfilling the Great Commission. That's what he's doing. And if we were to look at the world around us, and we were to say, what is important? Where is value found? Where is significance found? We'd have to stop and pause and say, it is not who's in the White House. There's, there, I mean, I'm not saying it's, it's unimportant, but it's not in the eternal sphere of things. What is more important? What is happening in a high-spec business building? What is happening in a school? The things that are consuming us as we are, we are drowned in media and drowned in all of the different things that are, that are screaming at our attention, this is important and this is important and this is important. And in the midst of all of this, what is really important? Well, God has been moving in every generation from the time of Christ in the midst of international upheaval, war, famine, all kinds of circumstances and situations. God has been moving among people, declaring gospel. There, he's been redeeming people, and he's been congregating them in assemblies. He's been edifying the believers, instructing the believers, growing the believers, and then sending those believers back out into the world which is around us. And I think if we want to find a life of value, a life of meaning and significance, we have to recognize that what's happening in this room, the decisions that we are making, the prayers that we are offering for our pastor and for this ministry, the works that we are doing to see people redeemed, the works that we are doing to send missionaries into the darkness which is around us, the, the passion that we have to see his work go forward, that is where the significance is found. That's where the value is found. And the things that we give ourselves to, the things that begin to occupy or consume certain parts of our life, I'm not saying they have no importance, but I'm saying if you want to look at what's really significant, it's the work that God is doing in your family. It's the work that God is doing among those who are visiting the services. It's the work that God is doing in the hearts of children in your school. It is the work that God is doing in the missionaries as they are proclaiming the word in darkness. And my friend, that is where significance and value is found. And the only way that we will find that is as we learn to die to ourselves. Look with me in John chapter 12. John chapter 12. John chapter 12 and verse number 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida, of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man 
should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Now that phrase in verse number 23, the hour has come, is unique. Because previously, Jesus has repeatedly said the hour is not yet come. He's still performing his earthly ministry. But the thing that signifies the change that the hour has come are the Greeks coming to him. It's not a work among Israel. Israel is not being replaced, but they are being moved to the side. And God is now working through this New Testament organism, the church, the local church. And my friend, when God begins to do that, it is important that we know that is what he's going to do. That is, that, that is virtually the main thing that he is doing in our time and in our location. And he gives the illustration of a corn of wheat to show how we will enter into that. Now, I'm not a farmer, but I know that if a corn of wheat falls into the ground and it's dissolved, it becomes the plant. So the stalk of the plant comes out of the dissolved seed. But if the seed remains on the surface, cool and dry, it will remain alone for thousands of years. Thousands of years. It has to get, go into the ground. <clears throat> it has to have warmth. It has to have moisture. It must be dissolved. And when it is dissolved, it becomes something that bears fruit, an abundance of fruit, a, 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 a huge amount of fruit that far outstrips its singular value. And he's showing us as the Greeks are coming in, he's saying the time has come for the church to go, for the church to send and to reach into that darkness. And the way that they will do that is by dying to themselves. As they die, God begins to work in them and through them to do what he wants to do. It's amazing how God lets us, be a, lets us to be a part of that. As a sending agency, there must be the death of self so that God can use us as a sending agency. As an individual missionary, there must be the death of self <clears throat> so that I leave what I know and what is common and what, what is enjoyable in this sphere and go into the other sphere and die and embrace the death that he might bring forth fruit out of that. In verse 25, he says, He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. It's amazing how God gives you and I the opportunity to be a part of what he's doing. He's going into the darkness and into the world, and as he goes into this place, he lets you and I become a part of that. He allows you, your life and my life to have value, to have significance. He calls men. He equips men. He sends men. And all together, we as a team and as a church, we become part of this endeavor of reaching into those dark corners of the world, preaching gospel in those dark corners, seeing men saved, instructed, growing, seeing preachers rise up, and seeing works of God go forward. My friend, that is where significance is found. So we see that the significance is never just localized. It has a worldwide reach to it. Look with me in Matthew 28 and verse number 18. Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 19. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So here we see that God gives the grace for you and I to die so that he might produce something new in and through us, so that he might bear fruit through our lives. But it is not just our lives and our immediate situation in our local church. He, he, he goes beyond that. He allows the church to die. And he allows the church to become a selfless entity that is reaching into the world beyond its own immediate vicinity. 
And as it begins to reach into the world, it becomes used by God to do what it could never do. And I believe this is central to the heart of God. This is central to the work of God. A few weeks ago, I was preaching in a church in, in um, where was I? Oh, in Pennsylvania, <laughs> sorry. I was in the uh, middle of Pennsylvania. And there was a pastor there who, it was a sporting church. They had, dri- they had dr- come down to about 30 people. They were looking at going to the Southern Baptist Convention and had become quite liberal in many ways. He was a retired law enforcement officer and he came into the church and gradually began to work. And now the church is, 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 has grown. And it is, it is a wonderful missions-minded church, sports nearly 100 missionaries. I have seen over and over how God works in these congregations, how he restores them, he preserves them, because they're in the center of his will and his work. They're doing the thing that he wants done. And he empowers them, and he enables them, he sustains these ministries because there's a certain selflessness within them a death of self where they are going to the mission field and being sent to the mission field. So if our lives are going to find significance, they're going to find significance because God gives us the grace to die. And he begins to produce fruit in and through our lives, here and throughout the world. Jacques Miller said, he that lives for self alone lives for the meanest mortal known. So Jesus announced in building his church, he is not burdening us. He is not tasking us with something that we cannot do. Rather, he is liberating us from the tyranny of self. He is delivering us from the power of selfishness. He is delivering us into a selfless being who can accomplish his glorious and amazing purposes. And he enables us to find an amazing significance thereby. We, as we become redeemed and selfless beings, as we become used by him here in Tigard, Washington, um, Oregon, we also become used by him throughout the world which is around us. And that is what brings great significance into our life. We will never find what we are looking for in this world, as we look into this world and seek fulfillment in this world, we will always be characterized by the futility of the world. But as we look into what he is doing, how he is saving people in every generation, he's congregating them into local churches. They're structured according to the New Testament. They are, they are people that are, that are living in his will, and God is using them greatly to reach into the world and to redeem men and women and to bring about his glorious purposes. And that is how we truly find lives of significance. If you'd stand together with me with your, your head bowed and your, your eyes closed, I just want to ask you a question. Do you feel that your life has significance, has value, importance? When your life is summarized, we look at our lives and the effect of our lives. Do we realize that knowing what God is doing and how he is working and becoming integrated in that, becoming a part of that work, That is where true and lasting significance is found in each one of our lives. And I just pray as the piano plays in the quietness of the moment that we would allow God to work, allow God to speak to us and show us how our lives can have the value that he destined for them to have, how we can find lives that have the meaning that they can only have in the midst of his will and his work among us.